All right, well, uh, welcome everybody once again to the 2016 UCLA Center for Health Policy Research Health Policy Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Gwen Driscoll. I am the Director of Communications here, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and to welcome our wonderful guest speaker today, Dr. Lauren Gaze. But before I do, I am just going to give you a reminder. Uh, we are going to be taking a summer break in the months of July and August, but we will be back on September 27th for a <laughs> very interesting and hopefully a little bit more fleshed out look at the presidential candidate's health plan. So please join us then. Dr. Gerald Kaminsky, the director of the center, will be uh, talking about that. And we cannot wait to find out what that's going to be like. So please join us. As for today's seminar, we will be recording it, as always, and it will be shortly placed on our newsroom at the address you see at the top of our uh, this slide. Uh, if you would like copies uh, of today's presentation emailed to you, just email me. My uh, email is in the middle. That's gdriscoll at ucla.edu. And of course, if you want to find out about all our upcoming seminars, our new data, our new research, there's always something going on at the seminar that's new and interesting, please subscribe to our free monthly e-newsletter, Health Policy News. And the address is there at the bottom. Okay. Just a note, we will uh, have a brief question and answer period at the end of today's seminar that I will moderate. Now, uh, as for today's seminar, we are very happy to have a special guest speaker today who could not be a better fit for what the center does in that she has a passion for social justice, uh, for applied research, and for data-driven decision making. Dr. Lauren Gaze is the Chief of Health and Policy Assessment in the Division of Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention at the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. In this role, she leads a number of research and evaluation projects to prevent chronic disease and to improve the social determinants of health. Lauren's interests, as you will see from today's seminar, include identifying ways to improve health through the implementation of so-called non-health policies and programs. For example, prior to coming to Los Angeles, Lauren was a health scientist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention where she led research and fostered collaboration all among federal leaders to identify opportunities to positively impact health through transportation, education, and housing policies. In today's seminar, Lauren will look at one such program, the Teen Courts, a popular juvenile justice system diversion model in which youths are judged by their peers and given restorative sent sentences to complete during a period of supervision. Did this alternative justice solution prevent recidivism, which is linked to lifelong negative health consequences? Lauren will tell us. Uh, the answer to that question can be found in a recent article that Lauren wrote for the Journal of Experimental Criminology, which is the link you can see. Ooh, I don't have it up there, actually. But we will provide the link uh, to those who email me. Uh, and Lauren, do you have it on your slides? OK, Lauren will show it to us on her slides. But you can also email me, and I'll send it to you. Uh, which is uh, the subject of the dissertation that she wrote for her recently awarded doctorate in public health from the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Uh, it's also the topic of today's seminar. So please welcome Dr. Lauren Gaze. Thank you so much. Um, it's really an honor to be here today to talk about some of this work that I'm doing in partnership with the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health to bring a public health perspective to improve the juvenile justice system. No worries. So today I am going to answer three kind of main questions. First, as public health practitioners, why focus on juvenile justice issues? Second, what does public health bring to an examination of the juvenile justice system? And then finally, what do we know about how to improve the current juvenile justice system and how are we working to bring uh, those concepts to bear in Los Angeles County? 
So we know that contact with the juvenile justice system can lead to a range of poor health and social outcomes, including increased risk for substance abuse, worse mental health outcomes, increased involvement in violence and violent victimization, and exposure to infectious disease. Justice system contact can also damage social networks and family functioning and decrease high school graduation and employment rates. And we know that these factors as well are related to a range of short and long-term health outcomes. So in recent years, there's really been increased recognition about the interconnections between these social determinants of health, like education, employment, and justice system contact. And addressing social needs, including decreasing contact with the justice system, has become an area of focus for health practitioners and researchers in an effort to tackle the root causes of health inequities. So given that justice system contact is harmful, what can we do? There are a number of ways to sort of keep youth out of this uh, traditional justice system. So if we sort of think about a simplified trajectory of justice system involvement that starts with problem behavior, leads to arrest, um, processing in court, and potentially being sent to, to, to juvenile camp, um, there's many opportunities to kind of intervene sort of along this trajectory. Uh, first, we could intervene before youth displays problem behavior. And this, you could think about this sort of in a prevention framework. We could foster positive school climate. We could strengthen families. We could build developmental assets. And this is a very important area, but it's not the area that I'm going to be focused on today. The, instead, I'm going to focus on the other way to keep youth out of the justice system, and that's through diversion. Sort of once they exhibit problem behavior, but before they sort of get funneled into formal systems. So for example, being arrested and sent to court, instead of following that sort of trajectory, <coughs> how do we divert them into different alternatives? And that's what I'm going to discuss today. So when we divert youth from the justice system, what does this look like? The, the answer is really it depends. There's huge variation in how diversion programs are implemented. So for example, which agencies are referring the youth, which in agencies are implementing the programs, um, how the intervention is structured, what approaches are used. So there's really wide variation in, in all of these aspects when we talk about juvenile justice diversion. So then, what do we know about effectiveness? Um, a recent meta-analysis of different types of diversion models showed that overall, the effect of diversion programs on recidivism was actually not significant. As you can see in this table here on the slide, of the types of programs examined, only family treatment led to a um, statistically significant reduction in recidivism. However, um, these reviews when you look at them, there's really high levels of heterogeneity in all aspects of the literature, including the research design, the program design, the quality of program monitoring and implementation. And this is really reflected here in these wide um, confidence intervals, um, the wide range of effect sizes that are observed in, in this review. Another review by Lipsy helps further illustrate the heterogeneity present. So while this review very clearly demonstrated um, that uh, therapeutic strategies better uh, work to reduce recidivism than control-oriented approaches, there's large variation within these kind of generic program types. So now I'm going to turn a little bit to discussing what we're doing in Los Angeles County to advance evidence-based juvenile diversion. The first point I want to emphasize is that this work is really done, and I think this is a key uh, piece of what we do, is done in partnership with a multi-sectoral um, coalition. We have wonderful leadership from our juvenile courts. They're a great champion in needing to advance this kind of work. We have active engagement of a lot of the key players, including probation, law enforcement, the public defender, schools, community-based organizations, mental health, children and family services, etc. And public health is, is playing a leadership role in this. And, and over the past about nine months, we've been able to really uh, achieve some sort of key milestones. We've completed an environmental scan of all of the 
um, arrest diversion programs that are going on in Los Angeles County. So we have an understanding of sort of what the landscape looks like. We were also uh, able to very recently convene practitioners to discuss emerging practices and models. So to get a better sense of what are they doing, how can we further align that with what we know to be sort of effective, how can folks learn from each other, sort of and promote peer-to-peer -peer learning, etc. The other thing that we're doing, you know, and I think this is really needed because, as you can see, we don't necessarily know what works in, in all situations and for who, is we're evaluating promising programs. And one of which, the Teen Court program, is what I'm going to talk about today. We're also evaluating a couple of other um, promising models as well. So what is the value of a public health approach to this work? I really see it as being fourfold. Um, the first is that we bring a population health lens. Um, folks in law enforcement, probation, the courts, they sort of, I equate it sort of like to um, medical professionals, right? They're very focused on this person, this case, um, helping them get what they need. But public health, like it brings the population health frame to medical care, also can bring that to other types of work. So it really helps kind of bring in that population health lens. Is this working for who under what circumstances, et cetera? The other benefit is that we really focus on root causes, so common risk and protective factors. So we have that framing of thinking about like what is driving problem behavior? How do we modify that? Thinking about developmental assets, thinking about things like school engagement, et cetera. And sort of thinking a little more holistically about how we really meet this youth's needs and how is that connected to other kind of goals that we have. So for example, if we think back to the beginning slide, you know, we know that there's interconnections between school achievement, being caught up in the justice system, risky behavior, et cetera. So when we start to talk about these common risk and protective factors, I think we can kind of help show that we're all sort of working toward really common goals. Um, third, we ground efforts in an applied data-driven framework that emphasizes continuous quality improvement. I think this is one of public health's biggest strengths, is being data-driven. Um, and I think that's definitely appreciated in these conversations about being able to use the data to drive decision-making and how do we integrate that even into more routinely how we do our work. And finally, we're able to convene diverse parties to facilitate meaningful dialogue. We sort of, because we're sort of playing this data-driven role, we have sort of that neutral kind of convener lens that really helps us have tough conversations. And sometimes these conversations are hard because we're talking to a lot of people with, who I think ultimately have the same goals but have very different ideas about how to get there. So we can kind of bring together these parties and really help think about what it is we're trying to achieve and, and how do we work together. And that's definitely been a strength. So now I'm going to transition to talking about um, one in-depth evaluation that we've done, that we completed recently. Um, and this is the Teen Court. Um, teen Court is one increasingly popular model of juvenile diversion. National estimates suggest that there are over 1,000 Teen Court programs in operation nationally. And they handle approximately a quarter of all juvenile arrests annually. The model has two primary intervention components. A hearing, which is sort of like a court appearance, where youth are judged and sentenced by their peers. It doesn't happen in a, in a courtroom. It happens at a school. And it's, um, you're questioned by your peers. There is a judge, volunteer judge, who's presiding, but it's really very peer-driven. The second, if they're found guilty, they're offered development-oriented sentences, things like counseling, community service, apology letters, um, tutoring, etc. These sentences are overseen by a probation officer through an informal period of supervision, which lasts up to six months. So the theoretical grounding for this intervention is that it's really um, based in sort of sentences that are restorative, that are helping address sort of the root causes of behavior, and that it's peer-driven, and that by kind of exposing you to pro-social peers, that will kind of propel you toward, um, toward more pro-social behavior. So the research examining, so while all this sounds great, um, the research examining the impact of teen courts on juvenile offenders' outcomes shows mixed results. And I've included a citation here. This is a systematic review that we conducted. Um, and published earlier this year that really shows that 
there's not a lot of strong evidence suggesting that teen courts are really effective at reducing recidivism. We found a couple studies that showed positive outcomes, one that showed um, negative outcomes, and most um, found no results. So they're definitely, despite it being a popular strategy, there's definitely not a strong evidence base. So what we wanted to do with this study is to examine the impact of two teen courts that were operating in Los Angeles County and look at their impact on recidivism. So to, we wanted to do this to both inform practice locally, but also help conceptualize the potential benefits of diversion programs for youth more broadly. So, oh, and I've included the citation here that um, is the full uh, study where you can find more details. I'm just giving like a high level overview here mostly. Um, okay, so for our data sources, we use administrative um, records from one probation office operating two teen courts in Los Angeles County. We abstracted data for all cases um, that were seen between uh, January 1st, 2012 and June 20th, 2014. Um, our sample size was teen court intervention group, 113 youth, and our comparison group, which was the 654 contract program, which is uh, another word for sort of informal probation, so it's like an informal probation program. It just doesn't have that uh, peer-driven kind of uh, court piece. That was our comparison group, and we had 194 youth from that program. So our measures, we had two um, outcomes that were both recidivism, uh, subsequent arrests, and then subsequent cases filed. So cases filed is if you're arrested, you're not necessarily going to have your case filed. It's determined by like the severity of offense, the amount of evidence. So it kind of indicates a more serious sort of offense. It's like a rough marker for that, or one they can actually prove, for example. They also consider your prior record. So those were we, to to look at it sort of in a complete picture. We considered both of those outcomes of recidivism. Program participation. We had three groups: the teen court group. And then we had two 654 contract groups. We decided to split these apart because they were sort of different kinds of youth that participated. Um, and they were different kinds of interventions, I should say, more so than different kinds of youth. The first was school-based informal probation. And this is where you have a probation officer at your school that you have to check in with, sometimes daily, who's sort of monitoring your behavior. The second group is uh, we call it office-based um, 654 program, and that's where you have to come to the probation office like once a month to kind of check in with your probation officer. So you can see the different levels of intensity of that intervention, and that's kind of why we decided to separate that out. Control variables, we had a measure of risk uh, that was done through a validated tool that was developed by RAND. Whether they had any history or of contact with the Department of Children and Family Services, this was just any contact at any point, noted as yes or no. The age of arrest, gender, race, ethnicity, and length of follow-up time, because different kids had different lengths of follow-up time depending on sort of when they came into the program. Okay, so for analysis, we did a logistic regression um, and a survival uh, regression model. So logistic was just any arrest or any case filed, and then survival was time to that first arrest or case filed. We had two versions of each model, um, with and without DCFS history. We sort of did that because we weren't sure from the data when that contact occurred. So for example, it could have occurred after you'd been arrested a whole bunch of times and then DCFS got involved, for example. So that was sort of a sensitivity analysis there. We also looked at differential impacts, so for example, you know, the type of case, gender, race, when you came into the program. However, because we had such a small sample size, it was really difficult to see a lot of meaningful trends here. So in terms of the results, the descriptive analysis, um, the majority of the sample was Hispanic, categorized as low risk and male, and most participants were between the ages of 13 and 17. Uh, program participants were similar in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, and risk level. The comparison group participants were younger and more likely to have had contact with DCFS. And we can talk about this a little bit when we talk about limitations. This can sort of potentially signal that they may have been a bit more of a risky group. Um, we had comparable rates of program completion and dropout. 
Well, we did have a greater percentage of teen court participants who signed their contract earlier, so they had longer follow-up time. So we did control for follow-up time. And the logistic models and, of course, the survival models automatically um, control for this. So in terms of program effectiveness, um, in our raw data, almost a quarter of the minors in the sample were rearrested, and almost a fifth had a case filed. And this is very high. And this, in general, is you know something we point out when we talk about the implications of this study, because these are mostly low-risk offenders. So to have this rate of recidivism is a little scary, I think, to me. Um, in the raw data, we did see a higher percentage of rearrests in cases filed among um, the comparison group than teen court. Um, so, for example, 18% of teen court participants had any rearrests compared to a quarter of office-based and 40% of school-based um, 654 program participants. In looking at the logistic regression models, we did see lower recidivism, any arrest among teen court when compared to school-based 654 program. And there were no statistically significant differences between the groups in cases filed, although there were similar kinds of, of trends in that, um, with that outcome. The survival analysis model, um, you can see the raw um, survival curve here of time to first arrest. And so you can, and, and the um, survival analysis models really mirrored the results of logistic regression, the multivariable survival analysis models. So we did see lower recidivism, time to first arrest among teen court when compared, again, to school-based 654, and lower recidivism, time to first case filed among teen court when compared to office-based 654. So to sort of summarize all of the multivariable results, in general, teen court was performing better than the two comparison groups. The differences weren't statistically significant in all scenarios, depended on which covariates you included, you know, how you structured your outcome, et cetera. But overall, I, I, I conclude that the results provide moderate support for the positive impact of teen court in, on recidivism. I actually think, though, that that's probably the least <laughs> interesting results of the study. To me, what I think is more interesting and what I think has gotten a bit more interest is the second point, that minors who participated in this school-based program, which, which I sort of alluded to was pretty intensive in its, in its dosage and delivery, showed the least promising outcomes. And this was very surprising to staff at the probation office, to staff at the Superior Court, to, to me as well, given previous work supporting the effectiveness of school-based informal probation. So, you know, this is a, a small study, and this group was pretty small in general, and there are some kind of biases that we have to be aware of, like, for example, maybe probation officers are just stationed at schools where there's more risky kids and that measure of risk isn't getting captured in the measure of risk that we have. But I also think that there are other potential explanations for this. So for example, the positive role of negative labeling and deviancy training, both of which have been shown to be issues in these types of programs. So negative labeling is really when you start to internalize and feel yourself that you are a criminal, you know, you are an offender, you're a bad kind of kid, and so that kind of then starts to shape your identity about yourself. Deviancy training is sort of something that's used more when we talk about, like, uh, camp, for example, um, where you learn from other kids, like, how to be, like, a better criminal, for example. And so I think when people are going to these school-based probation uh, offices, there's also kids there who are on formal probation. There's really a range of, of cases that are being seen here. So my um, recommendation was really just the need to look at these school-based programs, which are growing in popularity in, in LA County, and really look at kind of are they doing what we what we think what we hope they're doing. The other piece that I'll mention, and I've dealt with this issue in a in a 
and a couple of other subsequent pieces. But blacks had greater rates of recidivism even after controlling for other factors, after controlling for risk, after controlling for age, after controlling for all these things that you think would be a predictor of recidivism, you still find these disparities. So there really is a need for more work to better understand um, the sources of racial ethnic disparities and to identify programs that can be most effective for different types of youth. So this study obviously had um, some limitations, the biggest of which was that offenders were not randomly assigned to treatment condition, and participation in these programs is voluntary. So there is potentially some selection bias present in here. Um, that just means that, you know, like there's different types of youth in the, in the programs. You know, we, we attempted to control for this by controlling for things like I mentioned, like risk, et cetera, but, you know, some of that could still remain. We did have feedback that actually not a lot of youth, when given this option, uh, choose not to participate because it's sort of presented in a way where, you know, if you don't take this opportunity, there's going to be more serious kind of consequences. Um, so, so not a lot of people choose not to participate. So that's one positive thing. On the second, and I think this is, uh, speaks to kind of where we need to go with the field, um, there, there, we weren't able to obtain any measures of program implementation, like how often they were meeting with the officer, what they talked about, what services they were referred to, what services they accessed, um, or changes in knowledge, attitudes, or health outcomes. So there really was no measure sort of along that pathway of what's leading to recidivism still remains a little bit undefined. And so we're working now actually as a follow-up to this piece to do some qualitative interviews with youth um, to observe some of the courtroom sessions and kind of sketch out based on criminology theory what that pathway might look like and how do we start to test more rigorously whether we are implementing an intervention that is achieving its short-term outcomes, not just its long-term outcomes. So we can understand how to tweak it, right? I mean, this study was a little bit limited. It's like, yeah, yeah, it works or yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't really tease out like why or why not or how do we improve it. That piece is not really there and I think is something where we definitely need to go that direction in the future. Um, third, the sample was relatively small and the outcome was relatively rare. So like I said in the beginning, we couldn't look at a lot of differential impacts. We could look at trends, but you know, not a lot was really um, significant. Uh, so that's, you know, one limitation that we had. And then last, this also speaks to a need for sort of system redesign, I think. Um, results depend heavily on the quality of data abstracted. We had to pull all of this data out by hand, record by record, which was not easy. Um, so, you know, I think there, and this is something that I think is a, in conversations now, is how do we design these data systems in a way that allow us to kind of look at how we're doing in more real time and kind of more easily pull data. I think it's the same, it's the same problem that we have with like EHR sometimes, for example, like it's not necessarily designed to be able to look at the things we want to look at. So in terms of the implications, really I think much remains unknown about the programmatic elements that lead to juvenile diversion program success or failure. Um, we need to consider program impacts as well as, you know, other things like client family preferences, partner perspectives on the implementation, time, and cost. And as I was sort of mentioning before, I really feel that there's a need to collect process and short-term impact measures to assist with causal inference, to help inform theory, and contribute to decision making and, and process improvement. So in terms of, of moving forward, um, what we're trying to do now is really to identify, continue to identify strategic policy and program opportunities in collaboration with our key stakeholders. You know, we're working with the multidisciplinary stakeholder group. We just had, as I mentioned, um, our convening where we did some interactive activities to help sort of identify what challenges people are facing in practice 
what uh, public health or what the county could do to support them. You know, for example, people really pointed to the need for additional technical assistance, additional training, because there's really wide variation in, in what's going on right now. So we think the convening was a really great first step. And so as we continue to work with the multidisciplinary stakeholder group, continue to look at other um, programs as well and their evidence of effectiveness, you know, we're definitely going to continue to to move this work forward. I think the second thing is um, trying to infuse sort of a learning culture and a data-driven approach into practice. I think this is really a paradigm shift toward what works to support youth well-being and youth development. So I think we're trying to bring this in in some of our other evaluation work and in some of the efforts that are going on right now with a very exciting uh, piece of work being led by uh, Dr. Denise Hertz at, at Cal State LA, thinking about kind of what does um, a sort of cohesive strategy, a cohesive research unit for the probation department look like. Um, so there are some really exciting um, opportunities there at, as well. Um, and we're also going to continue to leverage complementary initiatives in Los Angeles County, including the My Brother's Keeper initiative, which is a um, effort that's being led by the White House to help sort of improve health, education, social, juvenile justice outcomes for boys and men of color. Um, and so it really, the, the framing and the messaging, I think, is right on in that they're really talking about these things as being interconnected. There's a lot of focus on the life course. And so for our work, uh, Los Angeles County has accepted the My Brother's Keeper Challenge. And one of the recommendations was to advance uh, effective juvenile justice diversion uh, programs in Los Angeles County and really look at seriously disproportionality and ways to address that. So we're continuing to, to work with those efforts. Also, there's a really exciting trauma prevention initiative that's going on in Los Angeles County, which is a strategic priority of our newly formed Los Angeles County Health Agency, which is, I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar with the recent uh, chaos, I guess, around this issue, is that the Departments of Mental Health, Public Health, and Health Services are all sort of in this umbrella health agency, um, where we're trying to really align efforts. Um, and the Trauma Prevention Initiative is aiming to reduce the disproportionately high incidence of trauma visits, injuries, and deaths in hotspot areas across the county beginning with violence-related trauma in South Los Angeles. So we are working to make juvenile justice diversion work a sort of explicit piece of the Trauma Prevention Initiative, which I think is very exciting. The health agency also has an Office of Diversion, which is exciting as well. And that's really looking a lot primarily right now at adults and sort of how to um, take adults with substance abuse mental health issues and take them out of the, the justice system and sort of into programs that can actually meet their needs. But there's also conversations going on about how do we integrate a juvenile focus to that work. Because in my mind, to really stop the pipeline of adult offenders, you have to kind of deal with, with juveniles as a, as a piece of that. So those conversations are also linked up as well, which I think is really exciting. So sort of in summary, I mean, I hope that this example, you know, today of our work to partner with the justice system sort of highlights um, where we might be able to go sort of with some of public health research and practice efforts in the future. And I think for me, the sort of biggest lessons that I've learned was that really public health research and practice really benefits when we sort of have this expanded definition of what it means for youth to be healthy because we find a lot of natural partners when we when we do that and opportunities to really leverage these complementary initiatives in ways that profoundly shape health and health disparities. Um, second, a greater willingness to focus on multi-component, multi-sector interventions. I think sometimes public health gets a little um, narrowly focused sometimes, like we just want to do this, we just want to do this, and it's easier to measure that way, its impacts, for example. But I think, you know, youth are, are complicated and there's a lot of things going on. So thinking about how do we sort of surround them with different pieces? How do we build assets in a way that kind of will prevent a lot of things or, or promote, you know, resilience to strengthen the youth kind of overall to have a better trajectory? That's uh, really, really important. 
for if, if we want to generate meaningful impact. Um, third, more meaningful communication and alignment with other sectors. Uh, I've had a ton of fun, I guess, I would say, uh, working with all these diverse partners. And it's just so great to get different perspectives in the work that you do and identify different kind of complementary leverage points. And I think that's really, really key to, um, to this kind of work. And then last, just more explicit focus on identifying factors that can facilitate successful policy and program implementation. There are so many things going on every day in the county, for example, that are not tested, that are just like ripe for additional inquiry. They're, they're going on, they're happening right now. A lot of times they have data sources. It's not always easy to get at them. Um, but, but there's just such a natural kind of learning lab, I think, for testing and seeing what works, who's it working for, how do we improve it. Um, and so just being able to link sort of the research and practice community, I think, is so important. And there's so many exciting opportunities to, to do that. So just um, in closing, these are some of the uh, references that I've included that are just give you a taste of some of our community partnered and policy focused work that's going on in my unit right now. Um, it's a lot focused on juvenile justice. It's also focused on schools, school climate, um, uh, those types of things as well. So if you're interested or want to uh, know more, I am definitely happy to speak, to partner. This is sort of the world I'm living now. So always looking for different opportunities to kind of continue to, to build these, these efforts. So I think that kind of wraps up. Yes. During the study, did you look at other states which have similar programs? Oh, okay. Lauren, and if you could repeat the question. Sure. The question is, in looking at team courts, did we look at other states that had similar programs? N no, not, in, not as a part of this specific assessment. We did, as a part of the systematic review, though, look at everything that had been published, either in journals, or, or there was a lot of actually gray literature reports. So we did look at it in that. And I think that we, we learned a couple things. One, that there's wide variation in the way these programs are implemented. Um, they all kind of follow sort of similar models. Like they have peers, but they're run very different kinds of, of ways. And you know, across the programs, there wasn't a lot, I would say, of evidence for really strong um, impact on recidivism, and that was what most people looked at. Yes. Were these directly operated programs, or they were um, ran by contract providers? The ones in our study? Yes. Oh, sorry. That uh, were the programs in our study run by contract providers, or were they directly operated? So the Team Corps program is actually, in, in Los Angeles County, is a partnership between three entities, the Superior Court, the Los Angeles Superior Court, schools, and the probation department. So if a school is interested in operating, the school is really the backbone of the program. So the school is the one that trains the jurors in how to ask questions. They're the ones that sort of administer and house the program, like all the courts kind of take place at schools. The probation department is responsible for identifying cases to kind of come in. That's their role. And the superior court, what they do is they sort of provide the guidance. Like if you're interested in starting a teen court program, you know, here's the paperwork, kind of here's how it works. And then there's a judge that volunteers his or her time and will come on sort of the designated days and sort of mediate the whole kind of process and sign the form. So I would say that the, you know, all of them feel a little different having been to a few of them, but they all sort of roughly follow the same order, you know, um, sort of the same set of questions because the teens are sort of given guidance through the same information packet. They're all trained at a teen court conference that goes on kind of annually. They're also trained sometimes by the Museum of Tolerance um, locally, which does trainings to reduce um, bias, which is, yeah, no, it's a great model for training that, that one. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it's structured. So any evidence 
that's showing uh, the social economic status uh, of the, the variable can affect the availability of different programs for the team. Uh, and also, you have three programs here, team quarter and uh, uh, the other one. Mm -hmm. to any evidence about uh, how social economic, social economic status variable affecting the availability of these programs too? So the question is, is there any um, evidence that showed the socioeconomic status of the teen or their family was um, influencing like what kinds of programs were available or the different kinds of services that are offered? So unfortunately, we didn't have a measure of socioeconomic status <clears throat> for the youth. We only had uh, race, ethnicity, age, and some of the other variables I mentioned. So that wasn't something we could directly look at. You know, because, okay, this is another point, I guess. Because probation, the way your case gets assigned to a probation office is strictly by geography. So this probation area office dealt with sort of kids from a very sort of defined geography in South LA. So I wouldn't, if I had to guess, and I didn't look at this, I wouldn't guess that there was a lot of variation among the kids that were coming in to that office because they're being assigned based on geography. But that's not something that I looked at systematically and is a good idea. Lauren, we have an online question. Um, were you able to look at ACEs in individuals' backgrounds? No, that's a great... Repeat it. Oh, uh, uh, question, were you able to look at ACEs and in individuals' backgrounds? That's a great question, and I would love to have been able to do that. The closest we could get was um, whether or not they had um, any contact with the Department of Children and Family Services. So, for example, they there was reports of child abuse or, you know, something going on like that, which was a yes or no kind of variable. But again, we didn't know when that occurred. Um, no, I wish we would, and I think in future work that definitely needs to be considered, and we need to design the data system to be able to easily kind of pull out that. I would say, though, that um, some of that probably was captured in the risk measure, um, because it does have sort of questions like that. However, we weren't able to get sort of individual risk scores, the 60 item uh, it's a 60 item uh, scale, but we were only able to get sort of the aggregate item. Okay. Yes. Is this study was part of your PhD also? Was this study part of my PhD? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yes, it was. <laughs> okay, we have an online question. Uh, just some clarification. Did you mention at the beginning the family treatment shows a reduction of recidivism? I think it was one of the first charts. Maybe I misunderstood. Are you looking at any family treatment programs? So the question is, um, did 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 I say that family treatment was an effective sort of intervention for reducing recidivism? And am I looking at any family treatment programs? Uh, so so yes, you're right in that the review, uh, the systematic review that I presented toward the beginning does show that family treatment programs are among are are the most effective sort of uh, component for. Pre preventing recidivism. So I will say that some of the teen court work does have a family component. You know, one of the um, sentences that youth are often given is to participate, is for their parents to participate in parenting classes, is for youth to participate alongside their families in sort of family counseling. Again, however, though, because we couldn't, we didn't know which sentences which youth got in our study, we couldn't tease out like if that was a component that was really driving the outcomes. And I think that that's a really important piece to look at in the future is does that piece, and based on the literature, we would assume that that does make it more effective. So that is a good direction. So, uh, did the evaluation look at specific kinds of restorative adjudication, and if so, whether some were more beneficial than others? If so, do you have any information on the impact of employment or related interventions, such as work-based learning or industry-specific job training? 
So this question is, um, did we look at any specific kinds of restorative adjudication? And if so, whether some were more beneficial than others, like job training, uh, work-based learning, et cetera. Again, this is a great, this is a great question. And I think that it's, we, we couldn't, again, capture like which sentences they got. So I think, though, that that's definitely something that we need to look at more in the future. I think you're absolutely right that things like, you know, employment is a really strong predictor of not becoming involved subsequently in the juvenile justice system. Um, and I think it's something that we should definitely look at. Also, you know, because these youth are pretty young as well, you know, different components like being able to connect them to mentoring programs. You know, in some of our qualitative work, <clears throat> that was one of the most um, uh, most frequently mentioned components that people would talk about. And what has been helpful to them was connection to, for example, mentoring programs and positive role models. So I think that's another piece, if I was looking at, would definitely want to focus in on based on the qualitative work. We got one straggler, and then I'm going to uh, ask people if you have any uh, further questions you can see. Uh, Lauren's email is there. Or feel free to email me, and we will chase down any information we didn't get to here. Questions? Um, Lauren, for Seth, there's, there's you know, an intervention every day. There's data that could be generated. How could uh, this community of policy researchers engage with the um, LA County to, uh, in, in infusing more of this health policy from public health perspective, but expanding our view. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, how can uh, folks work to capitalize on some of the opportunities, for example, the programs, the efforts going on at the county, how can health policy researchers really work and, and partner to to advance those efforts I mean I think it, I think that's a, I think that the there's really opportunities for partnership I think it takes being able to you know connect and sort of find something where it's going to be sort of mutually beneficial I guess one thing I will say about for because even for me I have to partner with all these folks myself right they don't just kind of come up and, you know, come look at our program, right? And it doesn't really happen like that. So I sort of have to, you know, convince them, like, don't you want to look at your data? And, you know, here's what we could learn. And, you know, here's what I can bring. And sort of really fuse that partnership. And then I think it's, it requires listening, like, what's important to you, you know? And being able to, you know, this program, for example, was, this evaluation was at the request of the Superior Court. They, like, really wanted to know, you know, what's how it's going so I mean listening to kind of what are their challenges and I think it's I think it's just sort of like any other kind of, of partnership and in that it has to kind of work out for both people and it takes a lot of listening and kind of feeling things out and understanding styles and being able to work at least to provide like interim results, you know, if the study is going to take a longer time because, you know, they, people always want to know like right away, right? So, I mean, I think it's kind of that negotiations in that kind of vein. I don't know if I have like a magic answer, but I definitely think that it's sort of a change in orientation to, to perspective a, a little bit that that's required. Okay, Byron, what the Byron's uh, uh, rule what, sorry? Department rules. What the was parent, the, parents? the public health department? No, the parents. Oh, the parents. Of the teachers, I mean, the youth. The parents of the youth, what's their role? Yeah. So what, the question is, what's the role of the parents in the intervention that I discussed? I think so, yeah. OK. Um, so, the, so that's important. I should have mentioned that. So a parent or guardian has to actually show up at the hearing, you know, when they're being questioned, um, and the and the parent can also get questions asked of them by the jurors. So in general, about a quarter of the questions are directed to the parent or guardian, you know, asking about the youth, asking about if they knew, you know, this person was going to do this this day, asking about how the child is at home, you know, ask those kind of questions. So the parent is pretty involved in that piece and then in some of the sentences they 
are obviously needing to help the youth probably complete some of them. For example, sometimes they're ordered parenting classes, that family therapy, that sort of thing. Um, the youth, the parent doesn't have to come with the youth to the probation meetings, to the check-in meetings, but being in the probation office quite a bit, um, <laughs> I know that they do show up a lot of times with the youth as well, but it's not required. Do you need authorization of the parent? Yeah, the parent does have to sign. I think that's, that's true in all of the interventions. The parent has to sign. It's an informal contract. So your studies uh, with the parents, okay. Oh, did I get consent from yeah. the parents? No, we didn't get any identifying information, so we abstracted de-identified records. So we didn't have to get youth or parental consent to get de-identified data. So let's take one from online. Uh, did you study the importance of the disposition of resources programs on recidivism? Did I study the importance of the disposition resources programs on recidivism rates? No, but this is something that, again, I think needs to definitely be looked at. Because, again, I think even within this intervention, there's going to be vastly different. Well, I wouldn't say vastly different, but I think there is going to be variation in the components that are there based on the geography of the youth, kind of what, what resources are available. I think it is going to vary. I think within its intervention, it's fairly standardized from what I can say, but I don't have a strong affirmative data-driven piece that tells me that. So that's a good question. That's a good future direction. All right, if you guys have any more questions, Lauren will be sticking around a little bit after. Yeah. But I think we want to end it there. So thank you very much. Thanks. When did you graduate? Uh, I just graduated. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, like